All right, we just heard from Dr. Stefano Cabrini about the Molecular Foundry, a DOE-funded nanoscience research user facility, and how we can be engaged with the facility either as PIs, students, or industry. Now we're going deeper into one of the four verticals, the actual last vertical on the four verticals he presented, and he'll be talking about single-digit nanofabrication for photonics at the nanoscale. So please give him a welcome again. Yeah. Me, me again? Uh. <laughs> By the way, thank you for inviting me today and uh, give this uh, opportunity to present uh, not only Molecular Foundry, that I, I've been there since we opened the door, but also some of the other scientific activities. So uh, now, uh, before I told you what is in general Molecular Foundry, but here I want to give you some example of uh, some of the projects that we are doing in my facility and particularly I'm involved with, with the user and even in our, in our own. So, just to start, uh, I, I'm not going to talk again about this, uh, but uh, we have also goats. I mean, that's uh, <laughs> to keep the grass <laughs> low, and uh, we are uh, employing those, those guys, and they're doing a very good job on uh, protecting us from, uh, from the fire. Yeah, so I, I want to talk to you about uh, nanophotonics and uh, how you can uh, manage the light at the nanoscale, how you can make the light uh, condensing using nanoparticle or concentrate at a na nanoscale. So I will uh, start to talk to you about some uh, example of a plasmonic antenna with a nanometer scale gap where we can focus the light over and over in very high, uh, but, uh, high concentration. And then I will want to show you how we can obtain a very, um, very peculiar uh, effect with the just the nanostructure in the dielectric but to obtain the metasurfaces and obtain a very important effect. And also, I want to go and uh, start to show you some other much more deeper concepts and how we can arrange nanoparticles to uh, make some exciton diffusion for a larger range. How we can use now the, la the nanofabrication or the nan cell suspending to manage the exciton diffusion and light conversion of many of the other effects there. So I, I will start with the, what is the, I mean, nano antennas, plasmonic nano antennas. This is a, a, an old example that we did uh, back in the 2006 or seven, I don't remember anymore, but the, there was a paper also in the 2005 that showed that uh, if you have a two triangle of gold, looking at each other, those are perfect antenna for light because they transform the photon in plasmon. Plasmon, plasmon polariton are oscillation of the charges on the surface. The charges are not moving, are just uh, started to oscillate from their position and they create some waves. Those waves, they have a much lower wavelength than, than the light, so they can start to oscillate even in nano, on nanoparticles. So the light is much longer, so you will not see these particles here but it can be transformed in a plasmon and they can start to oscillate. And when you put uh, those two close each other, you start to have uh, some oscillation that uh, they put the charges positive and negative one in front of the other at the nano gap. Smaller is the nano gap, higher is the enhancement of the field. So this is a simulation that shows that the enhancement of the field is all concentrated here. So you can really use, think this as a nano lens you take all the light, you concentrate and squeeze in a single point, and now everything is almost zero, but that point is very high. We use this concept for creating some of those uh, campanile teeth that I show you there, but uh, we want to understand also what are the limits of this. Can we put, yeah, you see in 2005, they were reaching uh, 30, 20 nanometers. Uh, they were really struggling uh, to go better we were able to make uh, four nanometers sometimes in a set specific condition, but it was very, very hard. How you can, uh, how much you can go close each other with the, these two tips? How much you can make an enhancement? If you look at this, uh, this curve here, you will go infinite, but then the, there is a quantum world. So if you start to be too close, there is a tunneling effect. 
electrons are passing from one side to another, another side. And then you ruin everything. So how we can study this stuff? And so we have a, a Professor Wei Wu from uh, University of South California that he, he came with a good idea. He said that uh, to control the, uh, the gap between the two of those uh, metal antennas, I can cover those uh, metal gap with the atomic layer deposition, very thin layer. What is atomic layer deposition? Is a, probably many of you know it already, but it's a process that uh, let in the chamber enter one precursor gas. This precursor gas is deposit on the surface, but it's just a gas at this moment. Then with the plasma process, you started to functionalize those precursor gas, removing part of the organic, and you let enter some oxid oxidant uh, uh, factor here, and now you are creating a, an oxide layer, very well precise, one oxide layer on top of uh, your structure. You repeat this cycle uh, several times, and you make layer by layer on top of this. So you can uh, grow this uh, oxide around with a precision of the uh, antron. So in this case, let's say I change the property, I can uh, adjust uh, the gap between these two metals. How can I do this? Just putting these two metals on top of some pillars, make those two pillars collapse together, and now they are touching, and the separation is this metal, this oxide here in the middle. So it was a, a, a good idea. So we did this uh, with the nano imprinting. So we replicate a very large area of those pillars here. We deposit gold, uh, we deposit gold, and then we etch those uh, polymer pillar. Then we coated everything with the atomic layer etching. Then we dip in the water, remove it. The water evaporating makes those things collapsing. And now we have a, a very large area of those particles here that are very easy to measure because it's a large area. So you can enhance the, the, the effect with the, um, just because you have a large number. And uh, what we see that uh, changing the the dilator in the middle, we have an enhancement that is increasing until uh, four nanometers, uh, around three nanometers, and then it starts to decrease. It's moving uh, toward the blue shift, at least the theory say that it will happen like this, but now we can uh, go exactly and tailor nanometer by nanometer what and see the effect. And those, this is another curve that we have that show that uh, if you have tungsten oxide or titanium oxide or silicon oxide, you change the dielectric property of the medium in the middle. So you can have uh, this curve that goes up and up and up, and then, boom, goes down. You start to have the tunnel effect. So it's not true that you can go in a smaller gap as much as you want. There is a limit. There is a, an optimal gap here that we say that when the things are efficient or not. And uh, here there is uh, some uh, TM images that show that uh, there are these two gold particles and they are divided by this titanium oxide, and you see the titanium and the oxide are in the middle, while the gold, there is no anything in the middle. So we have a real gap with some of the left in the middle, and you can measure that there is an, an optimal matrix there. You can do this if you can control at the nanoscale or below nanoscale all the property of those materials. And those are why they are coming to us, because we know how to do some of those things. This guy, Wei Wu, is one of the most expert in nano imprinting. So he knows very well how to do nano imprinting. He knows, he understands how to make the collapse. But how can I just start with that specific one? He was a committee member in Mexico. Sorry? Wei Wu was a committee member. Yeah, he, he was in HP before. He was a very good guy. He got his position in uh, South California. I tried to bring him here, but uh, I failed. He wants to be a professor. And he, is a very good professor, and also. So those are, are some uh, enhancements that we try. I mean, uh, once you have this uh, small gap, your uh, field in the middle is very high. So this is some experiment that they made, they made with uh, some uh, uh, dye in the middle. So they illuminate uh, with uh, just on a flat plate and one of those uh, nano fingers, and you can see that uh, there is a huge enhancement on the photoluminescence of those uh, dyes. That is a huge increase. But you can see also that what is the difference if you have a two nanometer gap and four nanometer gap. You have a big enhancement even with a bigger gap. 
because that is the optimal gas that is there. But there is not only this. I mean, there, there is another factor here that says, how can you put your analyzer there? And what are the other effects that you can have? And to study exactly what are the effects of this uh, uh, enhancement, we went to, we use a, we had another project with another, uh, the CNR in, in Italy. Yeah? When you have the uh, figures yeah. collapsing with capillary, uh, you get multiple, like you, sh you illustrated two. Yeah. Could be three, could be four, depending on the way you built your array. Uh, you could get some different results. Absolutely, yes. Absolutely, yes. And that is, uh, I mean, I, I showed just two, and so that to make two, we, we pattern, we, part, we cheat, we pattern a little bit asymmetrical the the in there, in the way that uh, those two are collapsing. You make three, you make five, that will start to collapse there. Now, in a previous experiment, we saw that uh, when you have more multiple particles, every single uh, nanometer difference, or even lower, it will change completely the distribution of the field in there. So probably you have a few, one nanometer bigger balls in one direction and the other, it will change completely. So it's, it's much more difficult to have a multiple one. But it did, we made a lot of those uh, multiple and uh, it's fun because it start to have all this uh, nice feature, nice design and you can play with all of those. So with the with other user from, uh, from the CNR, we made another experiment. Let's make those uh, teeth in uh, both eyes and thin and let's see what happens when we are going closer. Not only is the proximity and the tunneling effect, but we can have also some problem with the oxide around there. So we change the refractive index of the gap in the middle. So what happened exactly over there? So to do this experiment, uh, we use a, a collaboration that we have with the UC Berkeley where they have a, a helium microscope and we use uh, the helium microscope as a nanofabrication tool. So now the helium uh, is, uh, can focus much better and can have a very, very sharp cut. We show that there are, you can go with a five nanometer gap in a hundred nanometer of gold and be perfectly vertical with those two. It's very slow, so I will not suggest to use it in the production, but if you have to do a very small cut, now it's making more sense. In fact, in this first case, we use the electron beam, we, we cover a glass substrate with gold and we leave some of those uh, windows open. And then with the electron beam, we deposit some uh, uh, metal, some aluminum in the middle of those windows. We pattern those with the electron beam and then we keep with a, a small, uh, with no gap in the middle. Then we went with the helium mi microscope and we just briefly, with a very low current, cut the gap here. Now this gap is a few nanometers and we can control pretty well. But you can see from this picture that uh, the all the, the aluminum is pretty ugly, but that's normal. I mean, that's, that's evaporation. It's always like this. Really, it's one of the best uh, deposition of the aluminum that you can have, but it's pretty ugly. So we, we thought, let's have uh, an electron beam, the, the uh, electron beam patterning with a square or a rectangle. With the helium microscope, we made uh, the bow ties now. And you can see that the, the cut is much more sharper but also the effect of the helium microscope on the material is making a sort of a very localized annealing. So it's smoothing, it's smoothing very well the surface. Now we don't have any more this crappy surface where we have a much smaller there. And now from this point, we just made this small gap here. And we can adjust this gap very well in, the, in this case because the resolution is very high. And this cut is very small and it doesn't take very long. If you have a good alignment system, it's very long. We are using very low current. In this case, two pico. In this case, 13 pico. But the process doesn't take very long. Obviously, it's just combining this uh, small part here on the, on the part. So what we have is aluminum. So as soon as we cut, we have a very nice uh, sharp gap here. But then if we are looking uh, out, uh, bringing the sample outside and look at it again, you can see that the gap is somehow connected, obviously, 
there is an oxide. The oxide is growing from uh, the aluminum and it starts to reconnect. So what happens? That our uh, aluminum core is here and around I have all my oxide alumina. Now, my gap is small. I have a nice enhancement, but my field is not any more in the gap because there is the oxide. So it starts to be outside of there. So what we are doing, and we confirm this also with some experiments, what we see that if you have a very small gap and the gap is completely closed at the end, your enhancement is a little bit pushed out. So now you don't have any more a single spot, but you have two spots. So somehow you are separating the full intensity, so you are making a very smaller intensity. Why, if you have a little bit of space in between, even the oxide, now you can start to see much higher enhancement because there is everything is confined and keep it inside there. Not only, but if you have something that you want to analyze, now you can put this on the, on the gap there. You can have, you have a space to make it. If it's all oxide, you don't have the way to, to insert very easily the things inside there. So, and then uh, more and more you are you increasing the gap, uh, the more you are uh, reducing the, <coughs> the, the effect of the enhancement. But yeah, we are not in the tunneling effect anymore because uh, we have uh, this oxide that is in the middle. So before we say that, yeah, we can bring it very close until you have a tunneling, but then you have to figure out that in the real world you can have also some oxidation and some of the material in the middle. And that is a little bit more difficult to understand now how you can manage those pieces there. By the way, it's very promising uh, to use those uh, for, for many things, but it's very hard then uh, to bring something inside the gap there. So we let the user play with this, but uh, we, we change the paradigm with this uh, Campanile tip. We bring, they put the, the gap on a FM tip or a, on a fiber, and we bring the, the fiber on the material that we want to measure. That is a little bit more uh, easier, but no, not easier. Yeah. So now I, I want to move uh, on the other side. So we can control those uh, metal in a very, very small detail. But the problem with this metal, they are also absorbing. Those metals are absorbing the great part of the light. They have a huge enhancement, but they are not extremely efficient. They are good for some application. We found that uh, the idea of uh, using a ref high refractive index material and to create a photonic structure is much more efficient because now we can control also sub wavelength those uh, details and we can have, okay, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, okay. Here anymore in the back. So we, we, uh, we start with the idea of the photonic crystal. So if photonic crystal is a, a periodic uh, uh, structure, uh, modulation of a refractive index, it can be 1D, 2D, or 3D, and you have a different refractive index, one after the other, you're creating a grating. And this grating can give some, some effect of modulating the space. If you are also making some defect in the middle, you can also create uh, some. Uh, in not only the cavity as a grating, but you can also some defect mode in the middle that they can propagate in a very easily inside those photonic crystals. So, so far one dimension, two dimension was easy. We made some experiment to try the three dimensional photonic crystal. There have been some experiments from NODA in Japan and from other groups in here in the United States to make some of those, uh, they went in a few layers. Uh, that was very difficult to create uh, some defect in this case. It uh, was a nice experiment, but we wanted to make in a visible light and uh, with a very, very controlled uh, de defectivity there. So ARA was much more an exercise of style, not uh, any application, but can we do this? And uh, to do this, uh, we use a silicon nitride as a high refractive index material, and we coated every, every layer with a new material that one of our users was developing, that SBR polymer. It's a polymer that has a very low refractive index. In the visible light is 1.2 or even 1.19. So it's very low and has a very nice property as you can see here. It's self-planarizing. You spin it and in certain condition you don't have any and more topo topography anymore here, and you can just deposit here this very easily with a, uh, an annealing of a 400 Celsius. So not too high, but 
CGI, but silicon nitride is good on this. So now we can make the first layer, make some marker around, deposit silicon nitride, silicon uh, uh, S SBA, SBA polymer, and uh, repeat, make the patterning, deposit SBA, and repeat the, the second layer, again with the deposition of silicon nitride, again S SBA, and go one layer after one layer, using the same alignment marker that we have at the beginning. So now we are not <laughs> multiplicated the error of alignment because it's always the same. Our electron beam can penetrate quite easily and we can see the, the ring. <coughs> and those are some of the results on the fabrication. And you can see that uh, we have uh, eight or uh, 10, we have another picture with the 10, and the alignment is uh, pretty much in the range of the two nanometers or what we can check with our electron beam. So in this case, we write one single layer uh, at the time. So we can uh, decide where to put our defect because it's written that it's there. And this, those are some simulation and some measurement uh, and this is a, a defect that uh, we have done it with uh, some input of the light and coming out there. So you can see the wave guiding of the light that is propagating inside the, <coughs> the, our system there. So it was good to say this uh, experiment, but yeah, this is a pretty photonic crystal with a lot of efforts on, uh, from our uh, techni technical staff to deposit and line and all the other things. And it was much more an exercise file, but we can control very well the uh, positioning of all of this material with a very high resolution that gave us uh, some very strong potential. So knowing uh, those uh, are capabilities from some other users, they came to us uh, and uh, they start to make uh, some what they call BIC bound in a continuous phase. Those are 2D photonic crystal with a very high refractive index material on a substrate, we need substrate, we try to also make. And uh, this layer here is so thin that there is no any mode that can propagate inside this slab. But there is a periodicity. So the light uh, try to find uh, this place because they, they find uh, that the periodicity is, they like it, but they cannot propagate because it's not a propagating mode. So they started to figure out how to, s to adjust the light inside. And there is one of this uh, BIC mode that is not a propagating, but they started to collect energy and energy. And in, in this case, you can have a very high field that is uh, just sitting inside the photonic crystal and uh, it can sit on the edge of the of the of, of the holes, or it can propagate inside. It can be diffused inside or not. So this is a, a very simple, but has to be precise. If there is any defect here, it will uh, start to scatter from that defect. But if you are making a very large area of those BICs, you can start to pump a laser inside, and this laser is absorbing and absorbing the light for a pretty much high enhancement of the field. So they, they try to make also some uh, sensor out of this. And you can see that, uh, I mean, just putting some uh, analyte on top of this, uh, you can uh, start to collect a very sensitive enhancement of the, of the signal inside there. So we, it's possible to just using a simple structure, but the precision is quite important and the pureness of the material is also extremely important in this case. So uh, again, what we can do, we can adjust even more. And this is another collaboration with the Magic Leap, it's one of our user collaborators. They are uh, trying to make uh, the lenses uh, less bulky as possible. They want to make some uh, augmented reality for the simple glasses that you are wearing and they are projecting the light on you. You cannot have a very bulky lenses, so they will be too heavy. But if you are start to make some uh, meta materials or meta surface, you can bend the light, you can adjust the light as much as you want. But uh, this, uh, in general, this grating, they have a problem, they have a grating. So they, they are dependent on the angle and they are dependent on the frequency. But if you are clever enough to make some of those grating small enough, they start to not to be dependent on the angle anymore or uh, the frequency. So they can have uh, the same phase shift for several angles or several frequency as well. You can adjust those uh, material, those uh, dimensions very carefully and you can obtain uh, some of those effects just uh, adjusting the dimension of the ring. 
So what we have done with them is a very large area of those kind of basins with a separation of 20 nanometers on over a very large uh, centimeters by centimeters. So uh, an exposure that was the entire weekend. Okay, nobody else needed in their case and we just dedicate to them to show that it's possible to make some of those materials, some of those metasotates. And those are uh, insensitive to the angle of the illumination, so they have no any a rainbow effect that are visible on, on their glasses. That will uh, help them uh, to mm, just shrink in all the dimension and make it more efficient light. I, it's interesting, and but um, here you can see that uh, they, they are also sensi sensitive of the polarization in this case, uh, and they are pretty flat uh, for all the angles of the incidence. And it depends on what is the polarization, you can have a, a transmission that is almost zero or a, a pretty high transmission. So even in this case, uh, we use a high refractive index that is a silicon on a substrate that is a glass. So there is a um, silicon uh, the problem that in the visible light is not totally transparent, but those are very small uh, lines. So the absorption is small. So I would like to have a high refractive index uh, and transparent. Mm, that's pretty difficult uh, material, but we are working on trying to make some of those materials transparent with a very high refractive index. So uh, let me go on the on the last part of the talk is uh, we are changing the gears. So, so far I, I show you some of the devices, but uh, working on the adjusting and controlling the position of the of each of the single nanostructure, we can uh, learn a lot from uh, how the physics of the exciton is working. While the plants are so efficient to uh, accept the exciton. In, in general, their system are in, in the nano range. They, they have uh, cells that are good on accepting and some that are also good to reducing. So, and they are organized in the way that they can accept and they became created this uh, exciton. And then the exciton is start to propagate to some of the acceptor that they have done there. And the, the dimension are in the range of a few nanometers. Because of those exciton, they don't live too much. They started to recombine. Exciton, by the way, is a, is a semi-particle that is constituted by the hole and the electron. They separate, so now it's a negative charge and positive charge. They start to reattract themselves, but they started to orbitate each other. And you can start to separate. Many of the process that, uh, I mean, many of the solar cells uh, they, they understand that those are dimensions that have to be controlled and they are working on making those thin film and collecting those th thing there. But how can we understand better and how we can uh, manipulate those nanoparticles in this way? So to do this, uh, we are working uh, with some uh, nanoparticles and those nanoparticles, they are accepting the light and then uh, with the FRET system, so they created the exciton, and then uh, resonating between one particle and the other, they can uh, transport uh, this energy from one particle to another. And uh, the, the distance between those is very important because the efficiency of this uh, fret system is depending on the uh, radius to the, uh, to the six, so if to the minus six, sorry. So far, far away you are going, less efficient. What close you are getting, the mo most efficient is the transfer of this energy there. So it's important uh, to put this nanoparticle that are very efficient, very close to each other, and very well packed to each other. And to do this, uh, we use a perovskite nanocrystal because they have a very good uh, uh, property. They are very bright in photoluminescence. They have a very high quantum yield, between 50 and 90%. They have a very narrow emission line, and uh, the other part is uh, very, they have an overlap between the emission. Uh, and also, changing the composition of or the dimension, you can adjust uh, the emission of and the absorption very well. So, those are particles that we are developing in molecular foundry. And the other thing is that we see that they are more more squares and more cubic. So they started to self-assembling in a very quite ordinate way because they are cubic. So they started to be very close together. And also they are started to emit in, in a certain direction. So if you really can arrange them, ordinate one after the other, they are also aligned in the absorption. The emission goes directly very well between one and the other. 
and we made some measurements of this emission of the single particle. And you can see that the absorption and the photoluminescence, they have a, a lot of overlap. So you can absorb one light, re-emit this light. This light is, is the same overlap with the same absorption, so it can be transmitted to the other one, which is, which is here. So the idea is creating a, a layer of those nanoparticles, illuminated with a laser, very well focused laser in the diffraction limit. You will have a Gaussian of illumination and then you collect the photoluminescence and the photoluminescence it will be a little bit larger. So now the Gaussian of the photoluminescence will be larger. This is the difference between the two is the diffusion of the exciton. So now you know, you can understand how much the exciton can propagate from one part of, uh, to another. So one of the things that I, I didn't say that those uh, perovskites are very good, but they are very sensitive to water and to many solvents. So they are good for a few minutes, and then they degrade, and you don't you can't do too much. But we found a way that with atomic layer deposition, a very thin layer, we can separate them from the external factor, and now they are much more stable. They lose a little bit of the efficiency, but just a little bit. But now they are stable for weeks. We send uh, some of the samples in Europe, in Switzerland, and they measure, and they are still stable with those. Just putting a very thin layer, a cutting layer on top of those. So that was a, a pretty good, because now you don't have to make the solution, deposit it, go in the lab, an optical lab, making the measurement. Yes, please. ALD, one of the property is the conformal. It covers everything that you have there. Yes, you put a, practically a, a bag. <laughs> you put everything in a, in a bag so you don't, you don't have any more problem, yeah. Uh, so we made the two experiments. One is uh, with some sparse nanoparticles and one with very well compact to self-assembled particles here. You see they are pretty regularly assembled but there are still a lot of defects here. So what we have is uh, we illuminate with the laser in one case, uh, we obtain uh, this photoluminescence here. In the other case, we have a photoluminescence that is uh, much bigger. Now, you say, yeah, of course, you have more power here. No, it's not just uh, power. It's just, it's larger. The Gaussian is much larger in this case. You have a much larger distribution of the two things. Now you can see, this is uh, the, the sparse one, and the blue is the homogeneous, more medium-sized one. And you see that is larger because it, the particles they can uh, choke each other and the exciton can diffuse much quicker because they are very close to each other. So now we, we know we can measure the. Yeah, we, we can measure what is the, the distance, the diffusion, the diffusion length of this exciton, and we measure that is in the range of uh, 200 nanometers. That is quite a lot. I mean, uh, normally nanoparticles they have 20 nanometers. Now we have. 200 nanometers for the exciton to propagate. So we can make, uh, we can put pattern our anode and uh, um, cathode 200 nanometers and make those much more efficient. So we know how to do it, but we have to make them very well order, ordered together. But we also made uh, some other tests uh, using a time resolved uh, photoluminescence. So we measure one sample, we illuminate one sample and uh, we measure the photoluminescence moving out from the sample, but also waiting on the time. So now what we can do is illuminate it here, wait a little bit of time and see in the same spot how much photoluminescence is coming or m measuring the photoluminescence after a little bit of time far away from this. And for this, we can, we, we can make a map. So space zero times zero, you have the maximum because you are just, uh, all everything is coming there. Waiting with the time, you start to decay. Moving far away, you start to, to decay as well in the other way. So you have a, a sort of a map of the diffusion of two-dimensional and with the time of this uh, exciton here. And what we have is a, is a map that is uh, working like this. So you, sh you show that uh, it's diffusing and with the time is uh, decreasing and uh, diffusing much more. So what if you are making these lines, you figure out that is uh, it's not linear, so it's not a perfect diffusion. There is something that is making this diffusion going in this, going down. 
those is because uh, we have some threats. We have some defects that they are trapping and uh, losing some of the energy in the middle. But yeah, that's pretty much is normal, what we are expecting. But what we can see now, how much is this diffusion out? And this uh, average diffusion is our length, diffusion length, that in this case we are measuring 194, that is very close to the 200 that we estimated before. Uh, so just for comparison, those are the cadmium cyanide or the famous nanoparticles. The same measurements, it tell us that the diffusion length is in the range of 20, 30 nanometers. So it's really very close to the much better. So what we see if uh, we have a defect, we have a, a decrease of this uh, propagation because of what you have is uh, the exciton is can propagate in a lower energy state, but then from this lower energy state cannot go in a higher energy state. So this is a trap. And the only way that this one has to, we can, can relax is to by a phonon. So we lose every time that we have a defect, so we lose a part of this energy. So the defectivity is due to the fact that there is a, this presence here. So this is a simulation that we have done with our theoretician and we saw that uh, if we are making a propagation with a perfect lattice, we obtain the green curve. With a blue lattice, we are simulating random vacancies and you can see that the experimental data are very close and overlapping the blue data very, very well. So this is means that there is defect. And when you are doing a self-assembly, you will see a lot of defect. You will see some vacancies or some grain boundaries somewhere. And this is something that uh, we have to um, try to avoid and try to optimize as much as possible. And to do this, we try to organize the particles with uh, some direct self-assembly. So we pre-pattern our, uh, our samples and we let the particle deposit in there. Here is a cross-section of this pre-pattern, pretty tall layers and uh, the particles are falling here, one or two layer maximum. And what we can see from this picture, so the, this is 200 nanometer scale, this is a 200 nanometer scale. So you can see that uh, combining them, giving them some order, initial order, they start to organize them much better. They don't have any more vacancy, they are much more regular. While in uh, this picture here, maybe you can see, you can see that there is uh, a lot of still vacancy there. So now we can uh, use the self-assembly, so we don't have to put the particle one by one there, but the less uh, the normal assembly in doing the, all the job, but we can direct them and we can make them uh, much more regular as well. Not only this pattern can be eventually our electrode if, if we are doing this. Uh, this project unfortunately was stopped because the postdoc working on this now is working probably in one of those buildings here that uh, you guys here, you are offering much more money than what you can do. So now she's working here is much more successful in effect. But th those are many of the projects that we are there and we can work with, with your help and the help of everybody there. So let me go to the, to the end. So I'll show you some of the plasmonic nanopatterning or uh, some uh, of the high, uh, the electric field, the electric material, or also how we can manage the, the diffusion of the electron of the exciton in a material, working with the control of the, with the single digit nano uh, P in a molecular family. And for doing this, I would like to thank many of the people in molecular family and many of the collaborators that are participating here. And I uh, would like to thank also the, the, this organization to organize this nice symposium and uh, give us the opportunity to talk about this. And thank you also for the invitation and thank you for your attention. Uh, and I, I promise that I will not be back in this uh, stage uh, anymore. So somebody else will uh, come and talk. And We have time for a few questions. Very good talk. What is the last bullet you say, directed self-assembly? Can you make some comment on that? Uh, right, I mean, uh, the, those nanoparticles that say they are cubic, but in general, and they tend to organize themselves. 
But every time that you are letting the people organize themselves, they start to be chaotic a little bit. I mean, yes, uh, I mean, you, you can see here everybody's organizing themselves, and there are some space that available here. But so if my I question start is, this is the self-assembly in an organized fashion or random fashion? It's a self-assembly in, in a random, but I give some constraint. So I push those things to be organized in a certain way. I mean, uh, if I have to tell you, please uh, sit down and I leave you only one chair, you will sit in that chair. You will, uh, I mean, autonomously sit there, but I give you only the space for that. If I give the space only for three particles, those three particles, they will tend to stay there and organize themselves then, uh, there. So there is a way, and this is also the, one of the way that uh, the memory people that they have done it for the self-assembly of the block of polymer. They created some seed, and those seeds that they are nucleating the self-assembly around there, so now they can do for each waiter of a perfectly organized self-assembly. Uh, one Nothing. other question. When you started this work, did you have some application in the mind? We, we yes. Uh, we had application on the, I mean, solar cells and energy transfer in this case. And we want to see how much we can uh, use those nanoparticles efficiently for organizing those things. And we have some theory. I mean, those are self assemblies I mean, I describe you in a very easy way, but our theoreticians are making all the, uh, uh, all the equations to make those self assembly They made also all of those uh, propagation of the exit on uh, very well, and they have a confirmation of what they are theoreticians there. And then uh, now we can make uh, one layer that is absorbing one frequency, then separate it with another layer that is absorbing another frequency and so on. And everything is uh, interfaced with uh, some of those uh, uh, electrodes that can absorb the light. So in theory, I can show you that this is a perfect uh, solar cell that will uh, absorb all the frequency with uh, an efficiency of 90%. But it's in PowerPoint. So before going in reality, we want to see if we can do it. And this is the one of the first steps to show that it's possible. Another question? There's one over there. Get that gentleman a microphone. Why, thank you. Um, the, the work with the perovskite quantum dots reminds me of lead cell and cadmium selenide, another work that's yes. been done. Um, what kind of capping ligand originally is on the, the QD surface? And are we going to have to do a ligand exchange prior to the activation of the QDs in an FET or other device. And uh, o over years, we know that as soon as we do a ligand exchange, we start to ruin a lot of the electronic properties. Can you discuss and give us some perspective on our the elephant in the room with quantum dots, which is the ligand chemistry? Uh, yes, and uh, I, I know that this uh, has been one of the biggest problems. So you, you create those nanoparticles, they have their ligand, those ligands are useless, you have to change it. And change it is a big pain. Now, those uh, people in the sixth floor, I don't know how, but they made it <laughs> that they can synthesize those uh, nanoparticles, perovskite nanoparticles, with their ligand already. And those ligands are good for uh, start to self assemble in this way. Again, those ligands are terrible because uh, they are very sensitive to the water and to the other parts. So that's why when we are putting a, a capping layer on top, we are isolating them. So what we have to do is just go into them, deposit them in the glove box, making in a nitrogen free place, putting in a in the LD, and we don't have to do anymore. How they make it, you have to ask them. I, I can give you the person that is working on this. He tried to explain me, and uh, but I, I'm I, I, <laughs> I don't understand all all these things. But I can tell you. Who's the person and how he's doing this? And you can check with them. And uh, I know that he, he gave me perfect nanoparticles, and I just make sure that they, they don't degrade during the time. But those are the, the ones that are being developed in the, in the glove box in that moment. And again, uh, yes, the, the other thing that I want to show you, it was this picture. The same experiment that we did for this perovskite, we did it for the, for the same material here. And that's what we see is the 
the, the same behavior for the defectivity, but the diffusion length now has been much shorter. It's in, in the range of 20, 30 nanometers. Those ferroscales, they, they, they didn't degrade at all. 